This morning's scripture reading comes from the Apostle Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them, as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. This is the word of God for the people of God. As some of you know, I used to work for Valparaiso University in the athletic department. And I was blessed to have the opportunity of working with wonderful people, watching student athletes grow and evolve, all in an environment that I truly loved. My job as sports information director, a position that, which I held for 18 years, required long hours and weekends, much of it away from my family. As I look back on those times, much of it blends together. But when I see certain people or perhaps read something fascinating on Twitter, I am reminded of the memorable experiences that I had. This type of thing likely happens to you as well. You run into somebody that you have not seen for a long time, and they remind you of a story. Sometimes that story may be happy, sometimes it may be sad, or perhaps it could be one of those exciting experiences that you will never forget and you love telling the story to others. Well, today, I will share with you a somewhat humorous, but kind of a scary story about one of my experiences at Valparaiso University. The Apostle Paul's scripture this morning in his first letter to the Thessalonians conjured up several memories in my mind, some of them involving my time at VU. Now, there are many parts of the scripture that I love, but the theme of keeping awake jumps out as the major theme. When Paul says, so let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober, what is he really talking about? Well, the message to keep awake follows a rather dark prophecy by Paul. The message that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. He continues by writing that sudden destruction will come upon them. Well, these are difficult words to hear. But Paul has a divine, obviously much more positive message to convey to the people. We can call it a warning or just a friendly reminder from Paul. But what he is saying is loud and clear. The second coming of Jesus Christ could occur at any time, and we must be ready. We must stay awake. Next Sunday, December 2nd, the Christian world will celebrate the beginning of the Advent season, a time of waiting and preparation for the celebration of the birth of Jesus. Now, just a brief explanation of Advent. While the birth of Jesus is part of the story of Advent, there is more to the Advent season. The church during Advent looks back upon Christ's birth and celebration 
while at the same time looking forward in eager anticipation to the coming of Christ's kingdom when he returns for his people. The word Advent comes from the Latin word Adventus, which means coming. The Advent season occurs over four Sundays leading up to Christmas, and a 12-day celebration of Christmas follows, ending with Epiphany on January 6th in 2019. So essentially, the Advent season is where the Christian community waits for the return of Christ in glory to complete his eternal kingdom. The instruction Paul was giving to the Thessalonians had a positive message, but it was also kind of a scary message. On the one hand, he was telling them that their Messiah, Jesus Christ, was going to return to fulfill the promise of salvation, the forgiveness of all humanity's sins. However, on the other hand, the return of Christ meant that the world as we know it, the world that we live in, would be destroyed. But Paul was, telling the, Paul was telling the people to keep awake. And I have to admit that the thought of the end of the world is kind of scary. After all, this is the only world, the only world that I have lived in. And it's only natural to feel that way. And in full disclosure, there was a time in my life that the prospect of not being a part of this world truly scared me. But then I experienced something, one of those truly special God moments that changed the way that I think about the possibility of not being here any longer. It was an experience that yelled to me to keep awake. One of my duties at Valparaiso University was attending all the men's basketball and football road games. And while I was blessed with the opportunity to see so many beautiful places in the United States, including the tropical paradise of Hawaii three times and the cavernous mountains of Alaska, it meant that we took a lot of plane trips. Although I became accustomed to flying the friendly skies, I still wrestled with the vulnerability of not being in control of my journey to my next destination. Yeah, I had to trust the pilots. That's right, trust them to perform their skills to deliver us safely to our next destination. Nearly all of our flights were very ordinary and did not feature much drama, feature much drama. I kind of liked it that way, by the way. <laughs> However, that all changed in 1998 on a flight from Charlotte, North Carolina to Chicago. Both of Valpo's men's and women's basketball teams had played a game the night before at Troy State University in Alabama and were returning home. The flight originated in Atlanta and had a stopover in Charlotte. And that's when things got really interesting. When the teams boarded the jet in Charlotte, the pilot greeted everyone as they entered the plane. The pilot said his name was Mad Dog, and he was wearing this 10-gallon cowboy hat. I knew this guy was just a little bit different. Mad Dog was quite entertaining, as he basically gave a play-by-play -play to the passengers during the entire flight. Admittedly, Mad Dog kept us loose, and his humor kind of relaxed me. As is common in air travel, inclement weather, though, forces airlines to divert flights to other airports. In this case, Chicago was experiencing heavy fog, and our flight was diverted to Columbus, Ohio, one of my old stomping grounds having graduated from Ohio State. The wait at the Columbus airport lasted about an hour and a half but included an interesting conversation with Mad Dog. Through a discussion with a few of the players, the coaches, and myself, I got the feeling that Mad Dog was a very confident person, but almost too confident. Our conversation was interrupted 
with a weather report that the fog in Chicago was going to get worse. While still in the Columbus airport, one of the passengers told Mad Dog that there was no way that he should try to fly blindly into thick fog, or thick fog, excuse me. That's pretty good advice, I'd say. In fact, the passenger told Mad Dog that there was no way he could pilot the plane through the fog. Well, when Mad Dog heard this, his eyes got really big, and he said to the passenger, if anyone can land that plane through the fog, it's Mad Dog. Yeah, that's what you want to hear. A, <laughs> a pilot referring to himself in the third person, making a decision to fly a plane through fog after having his skills challenged by a passenger. So anyway, Mad Dog said, we were going to fly from Columbus to Chicago through the fog that apparently was becoming heavier by the minute. When the plane approached the final descent into Chicago, Mad Dog made another announcement to put our seatbelts on and to hold on. Again, not something you want to hear. <laughs> Mad Dog's initial attempt to land the plane through the fog was aborted, and he had to circle back around. On a second attempt, Mad Dog had to pull the plane back up again because he did not have enough visibility to land the plane at Midway Airport. He tried again a third time. Again, he had to pull the plane up. By this time, a normal one-hour flight was approaching three hours. Mad Dog spoke over the PA one more time, saying, let's all have positive thoughts and prayers. Put your saddles on, because we're going to land this plane together. So Mad Dog tried a fourth time to navigate through the fog of Chicago. As the plane was making its final descent, I was admittedly scared that we may not survive it and prayed to Jesus to love and protect my family and that I put my true faith in him. Whether it was Mad Dog's arrogance to land the plane or my own fears of mortality, I was definitely awake. Awake to the possibility that my time was possibly ending on earth and that my next journey with God was just beginning. I learned a wonderful lesson on Mad Dog's flight that there are so many times, actually most of the time, that I do not have control of my de next destination. I had to trust in Mad Dog to take me home. After all, I was not the pilot. He was. I had to relinquish control of my mortality and trust in somebody else. Of course, in the much, much bigger picture in our life and eternally, we trust in Jesus Christ to be our pilot through all the storms and heavy fog that we encounter. My prayer on that foggy day reminded me that I am not in control of my destination. Jesus Christ is my guide, my pilot, and my Savior, who is, in, who is in control of my mortal life, and that I must remain awake for my next journey, the gift of eternal life in God's kingdom. So Paul's scripture reminded me of this story, and his message to the Thessalonians about the return of Christ Paul also gave some comforting advice. He gave some words of assurance, advice on how they will protect themselves from impending doom. First, Paul said, for you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of night or of darkness. Then he later says, but since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love. For a helmet of hope of salvation. Paul was associating belief and trust in God with light and telling us to live our lives with faith and love. And in doing so, 
we are using the gift of salvation that Jesus gave to us, the grace of having our sins forgiven, the assurance that this gift of salvation that Jesus Christ gave us is our way out of the darkness and into God's eternal kingdom. How do you stay awake for Jesus Christ? After hearing Paul's words this morning, they may remind you of your own story. A story when you were awakened by the thought that you were not in control. That Jesus is in control. That Jesus is our pilot. We stay awake by living a life that reflects faith and hope to others. Perhaps by volunteering to feed the hungry or defending others when someone is picking on them at school or teaching others or in praying for others, showing our fellow brothers and sisters the true grace of God. These are all qualities you are encouraged to live by, qualities that Jesus Christ lived by. Your life does not have to include an encounter with Mad Dog. But please keep awake and live in the light. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. And it's because of the great awakening, the gift of Jesus Christ. We are blessed to live in God's eternal life forever. Amen.